My guest today is Dr. Francis Collins, a visionary, a thinker, a man who deciphered the human genome. He deciphered every alphabet of the DNA which you and I carry. He is the head of the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest biomedical research facility in the world. With a budget, for Indians it may come as a surprise, double that of NASA, almost $31 billion. A guitar playing evangelist who loves science, who loves his faith, and who carries both with aplomb. Dr. Francis Collins, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be in Delhi. Coming out. You sang a song, Amazing DNA. <laughs> yes. You composed it yourself? Well, it's a rock and roll song, and I rewrote the words a little bit, but I do think sometimes science gets a little dry, and it's a good thing to stir things up by having a little fun. You, you're also some, you're a great scientist, but at the same time, you are a devout Christian who believes in Jesus Christ. Yes. How do you reconcile science and faith? They seem two parallels. There's a lot of noise out there, and particularly from extreme voices that say that science and faith are just completely incompatible, that they are worldviews that you couldn't possibly assemble. I don't agree. Science is the way to understand how nature works. If you want to get answers to those questions, use science. But science doesn't help you with some other really profound questions like, why are we here? Is there a God? What happens after you die? Those are not questions that science can speak to. And yet, we as human beings are pretty interested in those questions, so that's where faith really has a place. As long as we're careful when you're talking about a particular question to say, is this a scientific question or is this a faith question, then I don't see any conflict at all. I was an atheist, by the way, until I was 27. I became a believer actually on the basis of feeling impoverished with a purely naturalistic view and not being able to understand questions like why we humans are driven to try to do good things. Where does that morality come from, that, that urge uh, so, to be uh, moral so creatures? I would normally ask these questions to a scientist, but you are a different breed and a different category. So what is life? That has many different levels, but I think we have to be very careful to say it's a lot more than just molecules talking to each other, a lot more than an instruction book of DNA driving a lot of the manipulations that are going on inside our cells or even inside our brain. Life is also an experience, an experience of learning things like what beauty is and what love is that science alone isn't going to be able to totally reflect upon. Life is a gift. Then what is death? Again, I think the naturalistic view is that death is the cessation of all of the processes we associate with a living organism made up of living cells. But for a spiritual individual, you have to contemplate the possibility that that is just the end of the physical being and not necessarily the end of the being of another sort. If there is a God which you believe in, I do. why do we suffer? Why do we have illness? That's the toughest question, I think, that all of us ask ourselves, whether we're believers or non-believers. For my own part, I'm not sure I have an easy answer, but I would say that the total absence of suffering might not be the best thing for us. For my own life, suffering has often been the times when I've learned something about myself that I needed to learn, and maybe wouldn't have if everything had gone smoothly. Suffering, as C.S. Lewis once said, <clears throat> maybe this is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world, that we are capable of being very self-focused, but then something comes along and we realize there's more to it than that. And if, if our existence is more than just this blink of an eye here on this planet, if there's more to it than that, maybe suffering is an important part of our understanding what's really important, what's really significant, beyond the day-to-day -day experiences. You have often spoken about the evolutionary fitness issues. Mm -hmm and the kind of evolutionary misfit radical altruism is. In that context, you have often spoken about Mother Teresa's work. Yes. Why do we have a genuine moral law which runs across races and religions across the world? Why indeed? This is one of those things that drew me as an atheist to coming to a sense that science doesn't seem to have a good answer to a question like that. Evolution 
drives uh, living organisms to reproduce. That's what evolution cares about. So how could it then be that a human being like Mother Teresa or Oscar Schindler or any of us when called upon to do something risky and sacrificial would actually choose to do so instead of taking care of ourselves. And yet you and I, when we see a Mother Teresa, an amazing gift of giving of oneself, we admire that, don't we? We say that's what human beings should do. Where does that instinct come from? I think that's a very curious thing. And if you were looking for evidence of a God who cared about human beings, not just a God that started the universe and then went off to do something else, but a God who's personal, this is a pretty interesting place to find it. This moral law written on your heart and mine that calls us to be holy. Maybe that means that whatever is calling us, whoever is calling us, is the ultimate in holiness. How do you then reconcile, uh, fit into this evolutionary aspect and faith, the kind of terrorism which we see? Mm -hmm. India and the US both have suffered. Mm -hmm. You had repercussions because of Osama bin Laden, India has seen because of Kassab, who was the terrorist who came to Mumbai. Mm -hmm. Is that diabolical altruism or what kind of altruism is that? How do you reconcile? Well, I think that's evil and I think it is a consequence of the fact that we humans were granted many gifts including free will. That that apparently is part of the plan, otherwise we would all be little God-driven robots and apparently that wouldn't have been so interesting. But the consequence of that free will is that we get to make a choice between moral behavior and immoral behavior. And some of us get pretty confused about which is which. And as a result, we humans often do terrible things to each other. That's not God's fault. That is a choice that individuals make to decide to use the free will in a way that's destructive and hurtful. India is not only the world's largest democracy, it is a cauldron where so many religions have, yeah. have it's been a fountainhead for that. Yes. You've been in India for the first time. What's been your experience? Are you carrying back any life's big messages from yeah. India? India is 5,000 years of civilization. America is a few hundred years old. Oh yeah, we're just getting started on that scale for sure. I get a great sense being in India of this wonderful diversity of individuals and backgrounds and spiritual perspectives. And yet I also get a clear sense that spirituality is a serious daily part of existence here in this country and I love that. And I also, having looked a little bit at world religions, although I don't know as much about Hinduism as I might, have come to the conclusion that most world religions do share a lot more than they differ. And that's a surprise to some people who think that they're all completely non-overlapping. And certainly Hinduism, as it looks at this issue of science and faith, for the most part, comes pretty comfortably to the idea that you can use science to understand nature, but don't delude yourself that that's all there is. You've said there's God in the laboratory, there's God in the cathedral. Mm -hmm. India has a God of healing, which is, and you have a God of death and 70,000 other gods. In your going around with the biomedical community in India, are you excited by what you see in India on the biomedical field? I'm very excited. I've had the chance to visit with some remarkable scientists and play to be a scientist in India or the United States or wherever who has their career just getting started. What an amazing experience that is. It makes me want to be 25 again. So that was Dr. Francis Collins telling us how remarkable his experience has been and his learnings in India and how faith and science both reconcile in India easily as it does in his own heart and hopes that NIH will partner with India in giving affordable health care not just to India or the US but to the entire world. Thanks a lot. Pleasure speaking to you Dr. Francis Pleasure Collins. Pleasure speaking with you. It's great to be here. Oh,